So, folks, let's have the doors closed, David. Thanks. Carrie, take your seat unless you're going out. Carrie, take your seat unless you're going out. Great. So, folks, uh, welcome back and welcome to those who are starting uh, start parachuting in two-thirds of the way into the conversation. So I'm Paul Clements Hunt. I've been moderating the sessions over the last day and a half. Um, we're coming to, we've bounced through local 2030 hub, broad picture. We've done capacity building at the local level. We had an amazing data session yesterday. We went into energy this morning and have bounced through that. I think I would defy anyone to uh, disagree, but we've had a vibrant conversation. Not panelists, not death by power print, not death by long monologues, okay? Um, we've had a really good conversation. Would you agree, audience? Yes. That's not good enough. Would you agree, audience? Yes. That's better. Thank you very much. Um, I should note that we haven't got our translators with us at the moment. In the, as many people know, UN timing is they'll come back at 3 o'clock. Um, so what I would suggest is we jump straight into our next thematic session, which is oceans. And I, again, this I think it's about the fourth time I've given this quick pricey. This is a rich feast. We have lots of speakers and lots of experience and lots of things to say. And we're looking to you for, yeah, I'm going to use it again, double espresso. It's, it's an adrenaline shot. It's three or four minutes. Distill your experience and your expertise, and that helps us catalyze the conversation. So my job is very much to try and ring fence a safe space for us to have that conversation. Anyone have a problem with that? No? Good. We're going to crack on. We are delighted to have a very uh, distinguished panel and some, uh, you know, we've, we're just coming off the back, obviously, of the Oceans Conference, the first ever Oceans Conference of its na nature in, um, in June, June with the call for action. So I think timing is good. And again, just to focus people down, this two days is about how we localize the SDGs. It's about models that work. It's about innovative ideas. It's how we get the SDGs down in an impactful way through collaboration to deliver better lives uh, for so many people out there in different parts of the world, whether they are the furthest behind or whether they're struggling in terms of uh, structural, uh, structural issues in, the, uh, in, 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 in various troubling context. So I will go to our first speaker, and I'm delighted to welcome uh, the Honorable Katrine Stedenfeld. Is that all right? Sort of, uh, who's the mayor of Malmo, Sweden. We're really thrilled to have you here. So I'll give you the floor uh, to kick off uh, for five minutes. And um, anyone following you will get three to four, so you're in a very privileged position. Over to you, uh, okay. Lady Mayor, if that's what I should say. Thanks now. Thank you very much, then. Excellences and delegates, um, Thank you very much for inviting me. I would like to start out with saying, and I'm the mayor of Malmö, the third largest city in Sweden. Malmö is in all way uh, a global city with uh, a great number of young inhabitants and 179 different nationalities being represented in the city. And we speak together 140 different languages. And everything that happens in the world, wherever it happens, do affect the city and our citizens. And opposite, I'm convinced that everything that we do in Malmö and in Sweden affect the globe and the world. As mayor, I have made it a priority for our city to focus all our municipal efforts towards the SDGs. By doing this, the global and the local goals become interweaned, just as they should be. And Malmö is as well a coastal city with a long history of shipyard industry, trade, and with an important harbor together with Copenhagen. And we do have ambitious goals for the environment. And Malmö is also a proud host of the World Maritime University, the only UN university in Sweden and we do cooperate quite a lot. And altogether this means that we, the municipality, the universities, the local businesses, and parts of the civil society do have a lot focus on goal 14, life below water. 
Just about two weeks ago, the Marine Environment Protection Committee announced that World Maritime University will establish the, Glocian, oh, uh, the Global Ocean Institute in Malmö. Um, I think that's a really uh, uh, interesting and important initiative. And the Global Ocean Institute is a concrete response to the United Nations SDGs, and in particular, Goal 14. The Global Ocean Institute will work across the sectoral divides in ocean affairs, engaged in forward-looking discussions and dialogues among representatives of governments, ocean industries, research communities, civil society, and other academic institutions. And the main issue is to produce policy and advice to implement the Agenda 2030. The Institute will be a huge research globally, of course, I think everyone can see that, and also strengthen our commitment to drive the local action agenda uh, at a global level. So, let me end with an invitation to you all. Sweden and Fiji, as we heard, and I think most people know, uh, initiated the big UN conference, Life Below Water, here in New York in June. And the engagement was really enormous, and the need for further exchange and collaboration was really stressed. So therefore, the city of Malmö and Ikle together committed to host another global conference on the implementation of the SDG 14 in particular at the local level in Malmö, in Sweden, in October. So you are very welcome to participate. And the idea is to kickstart a global network for ocean literacy, knowledge exchange, upscaling global, uh, lo local uh, initiatives uh, for the marine environment. As part of this work, Malmö and Ikle will host a series of following up conferences uh, until uh, 2030. So I would like to, to finish by saying that Local Agenda 2030 and the ID with local hubs is excellent. I really think it's excellent. And as I said, that we are interested in further global collaboration and we are open to host a local ocean hub in Malmö. Thanks. Lady, Lady Mayor. In just a few minutes, uh, I mean, I <laughs> <laughs> Another global conference is a series of conference uh, creating the the new uh, institute. That's there's a lot of energy around that, and is that uh, um, yeah? Uh, World Maritime University sure. is a key actor in this, and then yeah. we have lots of commitment from the civic society, working for example with children in our schools with uh, education, showing them about the ocean, educate them about uh, the environment and how everything is really linked together. So I think you can say that we have a commitment at all levels. Sure. And is, is it, is it um, a series of initiatives which obviously there is a linkage between the subnational, between the city government and the national government? Is that, is that part of the dynamic? I think you can say that's, that's one part of the dynamic. Okay. Uh, and you have uh, quite a lot of engagement for, from the national level, and then we, we try to, to work really close together about this. So project to 2030, and you're still the mayor, perhaps, uh, or, or maybe I not. Think we have some what, elections what, in between, but what, well, <laughs> <laughs> what would be the what would be the dream result? Would it be a thriving hub where all oceanic issues are sort of dealt with and explored and you have a real sense of a global community but in a in a Swedish city would would that be it that would be it okay very much so okay well that's quite <laughs> exciting but listen thank you for thank framing you. and thank you for putting so much energy out there I will go to the the second speaker straight away um, I mix it mix it we'll mix it up a little bit with people from the audience asking people to come in with questions but I'd uh, go straight to Thomas Christensen who is the chef de cabinet in the office of the president of the UN General Assembly. So, Thomas, we, uh, we look forward to your uh, three to four minutes. Thank you for bringing the uh, uh, president of the General Assembly perspective to the discussion. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting the president, who unfortunately could not um, duplicate himself uh, to be here. But uh, as those of you who are around the UN will know, uh, the ocean is uh, the hard blood of President Thompson um, as the ambassador of Fiji to the UN. 
he with uh, Sweden was the driving force in uh, putting the ocean conference uh, on the UN map. But even prior to that, as uh, one of the Pacific Island ambassadors, he was instrumental in crafting goal 14, the SDG 14 in the first place. Um, those of you who followed the SDG negotiations will know that there was very strong opposition, including from some of the largest countries in the world, to even having this goal. Um, and hence, uh, uh, in the crafting of the goal and in the, in the immediate um, implementation, including at the conference, not a lot of focus has been on the local level. Um, in, in some sense, as you, as you all know, uh, politics at the UN happens between member states. So it's a, it's a global undertaking. But that being said, most of, I mean, of the implementation, whatever goal you're looking at, and I'm sure you've had this throughout the day and yesterday, is actually local. So, so while the policies are global in the crafting, the implementation is actually local uh, and, and very much depending on local communities, mayors, uh, uh, regions, um, and citizens, indeed. And if you look at the um, 10 targets under goal 14, I would say that there are at least five of them who have direct um, relationship with local communities, and I'll just quickly run you through them. The first one is to reduce uh, marine pollution. Um, the second one is to uh, manage and protect marine and coastal ecosystems. Um, the third one I would highlight is to um, conserve at least 10% of coastal and marine areas. Um, the fourth one would be to uh, increase the economic benefits to uh, small island developing states and least developed countries through sustainable management of fisheries, aquaculture, and tourism. And the fifth one would be the one that provides access for small-scale artisanal fishers to marine resources and markets. Those are five out of the ten, and they all deal with coastal management, marine protected areas, small-scale fishers, fishery communities, pollution coming from coastal uh, areas into the ocean. And um, succeeding with any of those would also take a, a strong involvement of the coastal communities um, that, uh, in a way, are both part of the problem and part of the solution. And there are areas of the world where the coastal areas have already uh, created very strong alliances. For example, all along the uh, American West Coast, um, there is a there's an alliance, and, 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 and similarly around the Pacific Rim. So I think, I mean, coastal local communities, uh, in a way, finding ways of joint, joining hands and, and creating action by uh, working with each other would be a very good way forward. The call to action, the political declaration uh, adopted by member states at the conference, similarly has under, under its operational paragraph 13 a whole set of... Um, of uh, actions, and I won't go through them all, but they also call on uh, regional and sub-regional actors to take action, both on policy coherence, on partnerships, again, combating pollution, uh, building coastal zone protection, etc., etc. And the voluntary commitments that were mentioned, 1,400 that have been registered on the, on the website, and I'm sure colleagues here will be able to give more data, these commitments which have been put into the UN system uh, many of them come from local communities or have a local aspect to them. So I think if you were to really build that local approach to the ocean, there's a lot of solid ground to base it on. I mean, that, that angle hasn't really been put on the conference, but I think there's a very fertile ground to depart from. And uh, just to finish, um, the president has been very strong in emphasizing also after the conference that we're all in this together. So it's not that this is only for member states or this is only for a specific set of actors. No, so um, saving the ocean is, is for humanity because without a healthy ocean, um, our climate, uh, mankind, um, uh, everybody suffers and in a way goes down together. So I'll end here. Thomas, thank you for that. One, I mean, hands together. Absolutely. It's a nosy question, right? But... I'm not asking you to name names, but why was there an opposition to SDG 14? Why did some players not want it in the basket? Mm, I, I think, I mean, the driving force coming from the Pacific small islands who uh, feel most of the consequences of ocean degradation every day on their, 
shore on their livelihood. Um, it's maybe not felt in the same way in all countries and especially in the largest one on the globe. Uh, and and we, all, uh, we always think about uh, the Pacific Islands as, as in uh, the, the ocean r rising because of climate change, but it's actually much more than that. For example, um, the five largest plastic polluters in the world are all on the, uh, in, in the South Asian region, uh, China, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, and the Philippines. Um, every minute of every day, there's the equivalent of a garbage truck of plastic being dumped into the ocean. And by 2050, there'll be more plastic by weight in the ocean than there's fish. That is killing not only the Pacific Islands, but actually all of us. And the fish uh, you'll get in any restaurant around here will probably have a fairly high plastic content. Um, and the consequences of that, we simply don't know it. But in the Pacific, there island beauty and the tourist places we all love to Get go it. to now have plastic trash like that on the beach every morning and it's only the five-star hotels who have staff who go and clean it and take it away who actually where you don't see it otherwise it's a phenomenal problem all over the south Pacific. look thank you for that because you've you've baselined uh, the politics in a beautiful way without breaking any <laughs> any particular yeah issues thank you um I'm, I'm before we go to the next speaker because that that ex that description and then what the mayor said before that, it, it genuinely does excite me. And my very personal, just very briefly, look, I'm, I'm from Liverpool, which is one of the great maritime ports. And I think in terms of port people, or people who live on the coast, um, uh, that there's, there's a, essentially, it's about the flow of ideas, right? You know, to, 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 to one part. And you find with people who grow up on the sea, they're open to ideas and they're open to innovation. Are they going to send us out again? What is that? It sounds like a jumbo jet. <laughs> yeah, but no, that was this guy over here, right? Um, so what, what's my, my point here? I think that the, the, the local energy that you've described in, in Malmo and the political process at the highest level you've described, um, Thomas, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting feed there in terms of how local energy and perhaps local energy with communities connected to the oceans and to maritime living, um, uh, you know, that, that conversation is really needed. It needs to feed up, and it's great that we've got SDG 14. There used to be a joke in Liverpool that the only salmon you would see in the Mersey, which is the large estuarine river running into the Irish Sea, would be in a tin. Um, I'm glad to say since those days the river has cleaned up somewhat. But... Uh, Less of what I've got to say, let's move on. But I, I really do appreciate you baselining the conversation in terms of the, the inner politics, Thomas. That was very helpful. Um, I'm going to now move on to uh, Ms. Uh, Goshi Wali, and, uh, who is the director of the UN Division for Ocean Affairs. And we'd love your perspective uh, for the next three or four minutes. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished participants. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be here, and uh, we thank the organizers for coming up with this great initiative. Indeed, we need more engagement at the local level. I'll start with that premise. If we're going to meet the challenges that the oceans pose, and these are mainly coming, already touched upon, marine pollution, overfishing, urban development, and all of this compounded by the impacts of climate change and ocean acidification. Local communities play a very tremendous role in, in, because they are the first, first of all, they're dependent on and experience the challenges facing the oceans, and they are thus at the forefront of implementation of the 2030 Agenda. Notwithstanding, and here with the highlight, of course, the, the focus is always on states. The same states are also the focus of international treaties. But that doesn't mean that there isn't an important component for local communities, or, because they can benefit clearly, effective implementation of treaties can clearly benefit local communities, and they themselves can also play an instrumental role in assisting in that implementation. And I just want to highlight one central treaty amongst all of the many treaties in the oceans, and that's the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. If states were to effectively implement this, not only can states reap the economic and social benefits while ensuring environmental protection, but there would also be benefits for local communities, including from traditional ones to megacities. 
So how do we then, what's important is that we establish a nexus between the global, regional, national, and local level. And that is perhaps something that hasn't yet been fully um, or could benefit from more attention because local communities, not only in terms of what they can benefit from a treaty, can also find feasible and practical solutions to the challenges posed by the pressures on the marine environment based on their long association with and understanding of coastal areas, sustainable resource practices and solutions. And so in that case, we have to also uh, think about supporting bottom-up approaches and not just looking at it from a top-down approach and making ensuring that community action is actually well in tune with global, regional, and national strategies and priorities and vice versa. And to that end, we need an increased awareness and understanding of the interlinkages between the global legal and policy frameworks and how they can support regional local frameworks and vice versa. I would, to there, in that regard, I want to note there are an increasing number of local communities that have initiated actions as bottom-up approaches, and when successful, these initiatives have provided important lessons learned. I will just cite one, there are many, uh, but it's the Tri-Oyster Women's Associ Association in the Gambia, which seeks to address the plight of women harvesters who are struggling economically despite their flourishing production of oysters. But by working together to build their capacity, cooperative members adopted an ecosystem-based approach for the sustainable management of the resource. And this effective approach led the government to award the association exclusive user rights, thereby ensuring a longer term livelihood for, this me for its members. Clearly, this is not only of, to benefit for, uh, of benefit for the implementation of SDG 14, but also uh, is relevant for the implementation of Goal 5, which is aimed at addressing the equality uh, and uh, of gender equality and empowerment of women. There are many examples, but I wish to underline some of the lessons that have been learned, namely the importance of capacity building, adequate financing, empowerment of women and inclusion of older and younger generations, creation of stakeholder networks, recognition of the rights of local and indigenous communities, and the establishment of institutional pathways for community consultation and management roles. So clearly also we have to ensure that these kind of approaches are supported through capacity building. And I just want to mention while there are many initiatives again, and I'm sure we hear from Andy from UNDP, but I would like to mention one program that we are engaged in. It's the United Nations, the Nippon Foundation of Japan Fellowship Program and its network of alumni through which in Geralia, we are exposing practitioners engaged in national and local programs of work to the global level in order to provide this enhanced understanding of how the different levels can be mutually supportive if developed. I would stop there, um, but as clearly there's a lot of work to be done and it's an ongoing conversation. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna hover and I'm gonna give thank you. We've had the first three panelists. There's a, there's a lot to unpack, um, right? And I just wanna give the room an opportunity if there are any uh, questions or points of clarification, or anyone wants to add a perspective, the gentleman, I think you're raising your arm, and I would guess you're a millennial, which is fantastic, so get your mic on and ask the question, and introduce yourself, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Kyle, I'm an intern at uh, NGLS. Um, I've just been thinking that, it, from the sounds of things, there's already been so much damage done uh, to our oceans. Um, for example, in 2016, the Great Barrier Reef died. Uh, just five days ago, um, the owner of the Fukushima plant in Japan is dumping 770,000 tons of nuclear waste into the ocean, um, which is just terrible. So um, apart from sustainable solutions that we can put in, is there anything that we can do to actually recover the damage that's already been done to our oceans? The millennials are killing it with questions over the last two days. I mean, that, that is just, that's wonderful. Kyle, well, Kyle where are you from? Uh, London. London? Yeah. Which is, it's a sort of port, isn't it, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. There are ports there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Let's, that's the first question. I'll take one other. The gentleman uh, in the, the second row, if you could speak to the microphone, turn it on, and introduce yourself. Uh, Thank yeah, you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm George. My organization is Business Innovation Research and Development. Uh, I, I want I have a two sub question to ask the, to a member of the panelists. 
uh, I want to I want to know why there was an ocean in uh, in uh, in Paris Paris Agreement. There was no ocean. They didn't talk about ocean. Talk about everything except ocean. Uh, second second uh, sub question is about the fact that I don't know why you have so much hard time and hard work for the citizen which I'm representing, and the, and because all the if I take for example the the, the, the plastic in the ocean. This is, this is the role of the companies to organize the packaging of, of goods. They can, they can make uh, a, a degradable, biodegradable packaging, so we don't need to clean the, the sea. Thank you. Okay, well, there's a lot in that. Um, who wants to take Carl's question? Anyone fancy? Good, game on. And, uh, and a brief addition from Thomas as well. So Carl's question, then Thomas, and then we'll deal with Joel's question. So you want me yeah. to answer each one of them? No, or no, just, just do, do one. Do yeah. What can we do in order to uh, clean up the mess? Well, um, I don't know about the Fukushima, uh, what you've just uh, described, but certainly um, there have been many examples where marine protected areas or similar area-based management tools have shown uh, that the ecosystem was able to uh, restore itself. So. Um, of course, in the case of the Great Barrier Reef, we're also dealing with the impacts of climate change. Um, so that, of course, is a much broader uh, question. What can we all do? And it's a little bit touches upon the question of what can we as citizens do? We can all make a difference, including in respect of trying to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you for that. Thomas, a brief addition to that on Carl's question? Or you I mean, there's a, the UN Environment uh, Program has a general campaign on the stop or uh, combat plastics, and I, I, would, uh, I would urge you to look that one up because uh, th there's a lot to the plastic questions. There's plastic in almost everything you use every day. There's plastic in your toothpaste. There's plastic in the paint. There's plastic in the makeup. Uh, all that plastic becomes microplastics, is washed into the ocean, eaten by the algae and eaten by the fish. Um, stop using straws when you go to McDonald's. There are... <laughs> I think I've seen a staggering figure. There's about 500 million straws produced every day in the United States. Most of that ends out in the ocean, ends in the noses of the turtles and in the bellies of whales and sharks and so on. Um, so, so think about every, all the plastic you use and, and stop doing it and join campaigns uh, of changing that. But in more general, yeah, as consumers and of uh, all kinds of good, uh, same thing for fish. Uh, whenever you eat a tuna sandwich or a tuna steak, ask where the tuna comes from. There's an illegal fishery of tuna to the volume of about $27 billion every year. Most of the tuna you eat is actually illegally fished. Um, insistent traceability of, of everything you put in your mouth that comes from the ocean. Um, and so on and so forth. It's a much, it's a much longer list, but... Uh, Carl, you've got a lot to do with your friends, right? Okay, and you're hopefully going to be around longer than we are, so get on with it. Um, Thomas, thank you for that. Uh, and Joel's question, one, why was there no uh, real ocean component to COP21 Paris? And then the second part of your question, just recast that. The second part, ask it again. What, ask the second bit of your question again. Yeah, I would, I would... Speak to your microphone. Yeah, sorry, because you say that there are five uh, targets in, in the tenth of target, I think the ratio is not very good because... If you look at the plastic bag, I take the example of the plastic bags. Just very quickly. We could, we could tackle the, the issue of plastic bag at the, at the bottom of the supply chain, not at the end of the supply chain. Okay. It would be much easier. Okay, that's good. Who would like to... Um, I haven't got your name on my head, so... Yeah. Andy Hudson. Yeah, thanks. Hi. Got you, Danny. Uh, Andrew, yeah. Andrew Hudson. Well, on his first point, I don't know the specifics of the political processes that, as he notes very accurately, led to really the, the, the omission of oceans in the Paris Agreement largely, uh, it's, it's wrong because uh, I would arguably, I'm an ocean scientist, I'm biased, but if you look at the three uh, triple hits the ocean is taking from climate change, which are ocean acidification, ocean warming, and ocean deoxygen, deoxygenation, to me those are equally, uh, the ramifications of those things in a business as usual scenario are equally as serious as climate change to humanity and to the ocean's integrity. Um, and we can talk about that in more detail. On plastics, spot on. You know, uh, it, it cannot be an end of pipe solution. It has to start at the very origin of plastics, the design, manufacture, integration into products, and obviously setting up systems that allow for uh, much, much higher rates of uh, recovery, reuse, uh, and recycling. That's, that's a given. 
And Andrew, that's a fast start into your three or four minutes. I think you are on deck now, if I, my eyes are correct. Um, but again, uh, Miss Gotu Wanley, thank you very much. Put your hands together, and then we'll go to Mr. Hudson. <laughs> on deck. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, sir. Floor is yours. So, yeah, we, I think this group in particular knows the, the long-term trends we're seeing of, of uh, co concentrations of populations in cities, in coastal areas in particular, the huge concentration of economic activity, production, consumption, et cetera, in, in cities. And, of course, cities as a major um, vehicle and engine for financing, for capital mobilization, and so forth. So, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that subnational actors from cities to provinces to private companies to NGOs and CSOs all, all have to be seriously engaged in this uh, SDG 14 uh, agenda going forward. And, that, and, and that's both in terms of implementing as the mayor, I think, alluded to, implementing certain national obligations, even regional obligations, even global obligations, but also, of course, developing their own local ocean policy and management measures. So, for example, if you look at untreated wastewater, which is a source, one of the major sources of nutrient uh, pollution to the oceans in the world, um, that these cause hypoxia, which, of course, shows up as a key as aspect of SDG 14.1. Clearly, to address that, we have to dramatically s scale up the implementation of wastewater treatment around the world, even in the developed world. A lot has to be done. If you look at SDG 6.3, which is the water SDG, it has a target to have the proportion of wastewater on Earth that is untreated. I did, we've crunched some numbers on that. That means bringing wastewater treatment to about 150 million people per year between now and 2030. That is a huge task, but if you achieve that, or even come close to achieving that, the benefits to the ocean will be, will be massive. So cities, you know, as, as important centers of population, of economic activity, also are clearly major hotspots for plastics pollution, uh, but also because of their concentration of people, of ideas, of, of creativity, their economies of scale, I think they offer very important opportunities to put in place very innovative incentives, practices, and so forth to begin to close this whole loop on, on the plastics economy, which ultimately has to occur, as I referred earlier, to, at a global level. Um, similarly, cities, provinces, large companies are all major sources of CO2 emissions, so they can all make major contributions to slowing and ultimately reversing ocean acidification by moving toward low and ultimately zero uh, carbon emission trajectories through various incentives, energy efficiency, renewable energy, carbon offsets, etc. Cities can do their part on promoting sustainable fisheries. They can help incentivize and promote uh, consumer, uh, supplier, and restaurant uh, awareness of the increasing number of options that are out there to purchase and consume seafood that is certified as, as sustainably caught. And then lastly, cities can provide um, local models for state-of-the-art um, area-based marine management, uh, marine protected areas, and so forth, through, through tools like MPAs, um, marine spatial planning, and integrated coastal management. So there are just some introductory remarks, and I'll touch on some other issues as we get into Andrew, discussion. brilliant. I'm going to bounce one of the things you said straight back to the mayor. I'm guessing you've got a proud fishing history in Malmo and that you've got great restaurants. Uh, how are they doing on the supply chain stuff in terms of sustainable seafood? Um, I think, I think actually that we have the same problem worldwide, that we have lots of issues uh, in, in the industry with, with this kind of uh, problem. Um, but I think, well, uh, can you formulate the question again? Yeah. Sorry? If I go to a restaurant in Malmo yeah. and I order a great big succulent juicy sea bass, mm -hmm. I don't know, whatever, right? Can I be confident that the restaurateurs and the supply chain are aware of the sustainability yeah. gig? And yeah. that, that's, my, think, that's the question. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, I think we have some problems everywhere that you can't be really confident, but we have lots of local industries and, and restaurants that really are, are proud to work quite hard with this sustainability and, and uh, have... Uh, uh, a focus to, to just serve like ecological proved uh, gotcha. products yeah. and that's something we work hard with within the city so I think in general you can always find somebody that doesn't care that much and we do have lots of local focus and, and restaurants that are really proud of their own work I was a bit unfair to hijack you with that but I I'm just I'm planning on coming to your conference in October okay and I need Thank to, you. I need to get my restaurant sorted out clearly I you know. show you some All good right. ones 
All right, Andrew, that was super input. And um, we use clapping hands in this last two days to avoid deep vein thrombosis. So put your hands together. No. <laughs> keep, keep the blood flowing. Um, I'm expecting one more collect question from a millennial. Uh, you're not allowed to speak. You, you create, he, this guy individually created the fire alarm um, before, before lunch. Um, okay, um, right. So let me just think. I will take, for Andrew, I think, Stella, if you can introduce which organization you're with, and of course we'll let you speak. Quick question, quick question, then we move on to the next speakers who are being very patient. I think I almost fit in the millennials. I'm a bit too old for that, but... <laughs> Almost. I have uh, three quick points, actually. Uh, who are you? Uh, I'm Stella Bartolini, representing World Ocean Council at the PrepCom BBNJ meeting at the moment. Um, so just to get back to the gentleman. Super quick. Yes. Um, oceans were not mentioned because within the mandate UNF triple C is anthropogenic sources of climate change. So oceans are a, a sink of, of a carbon but uh, they themselves are not directly anthropogenic sources of climate change. So there you go. And uh, I think uh, an issue is um, that it's not enough to just ask where the fish is from because there's a, a very big problem with mislabeling of fish species. So a lot of times it's not going to be labeled correctly. And of course, when it is IUU fish, um, that won't show in the uh, supply chain. So <laughs> nowhere is going to tell you that that tuna is coming from illegal uh, fishing. And um, I think uh, one question that I did have is we're talking a lot about uh, local uh, communities, coastal communities, um, benefiting from the oceans. But of course, let us not forget that non-coastal communities and landlocked countries also should benefit and can benefit from the oceans because the high seas belong to all states. And um, I think more capacity building should be in place to allow for that to happen because the ocean d does have the capacity to provide for all human beings. Thank you. Stella, that, they were, that was really good input, and thank you for delivering it so quickly. Um, the gentleman, urban farmer, wait for the crunch. Go. Uh, um, in this city, and it occurs to me that maybe we should all be honest with the situation in the fact that uh, we're actually at war with the oceans, and we're winning. We're, we're killing the oceans very quickly. And to that effect, I'm wondering... Who's actually enforcing and who's actually policing these oceans? Because I know that we have the technology via satellites to very readily identify who are the culprits of uh, illegal fishing and pollution, but no one seems to be enforcing it. So I'm wondering what we can do as a group of people to actually move this higher up in a priority for our global standards and, and two, to actually ensure that those standards are actually held uh, uh, accountable. And you're from Melbourne, aren't you? Which is a big port, isn't it? Got you. So you know about this. Yeah, game on. All right. Who wants to take that one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Two, two brief, two brief responses because that's a conversation which could go on for a long time. Um, please. Thank you. Thanks for the question. It's a very good question. I love the question, actually, because it gives me the chance to say, of course, that when it comes to land-based sources of pollution, actually, there are binding obligations under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and also a lot of soft law instruments, no least the Global Program of Action for the Protection of Marine Environment from Land-Based Activities. But of course, even when it comes to hard law, this is left to the prerogative of the coastal state. So, is this a hopeless situation? No, as I said, we all have, you can, you as a consumer, number one, or as a, somebody who actually uh, has an, uh, the chance to, to regulate what goes into the oceans, certainly has a role to play. We can all prevent and reduce control pollution of the marine environment from land-based activities. Uh, that also is not only just limited to social pollution, but also, of course, from land, uh, um, cities, etc., de urban development, etc. So, and we as consumers can also make our voices heard at the political level. So it's also at the citizen level. So there's a lot more that needs to be done, but a li too little attention because it is within the sovereignty of states. 
um, states actually have not done enough and there isn't sufficient pressure on them. Of course, they themselves are also going to lose out because for the same waters, whatever waters are within there and under their national jurisdiction, is also the same waters from which they hope to benefit in terms of living marine resources. So who wants to eat fish? or any other crustaceans from that kind of environment. So there is an incentive, of course, for states to do more. But the fact is a lot of more capacity building needs to happen. Uh, a lot of states are not in the, in the position to do more. On the enforcement side on fisheries, I'll be very quick. Yes, it is possible to enforce against IUU fishing. There are instruments in place. Again, it's a, but most of the time, especially on the high seas, this is left up to flag state jurisdiction, which is in the domain of the, the state whose flag the ship flies, is supposed to enforce against these kind of practices. So it also depends on what kind of flag state it is. Is it a highly responsible one? Or is it one that also uses the opportunity whenever it's also engaged in IEU fishing to also be engaged in other illegal activities? These are sometimes very much linked. Thank you. They don't look at it the same way, but then you've got like the Sea Shepherd, for instance, which is protecting the waters outside of anyone's boundaries, jurisdictions. Points well taken. Sorry. Thomas. Uh, again, very long conversation, but I think it, part of it, and, and, and Andrew is of course right when he says that, uh, for example, plastic has to be addressed at the source uh, the question is, what do you do when it's not? Uh, what can you as citizens or concerned consumers do? I mentioned plastic and fish before, um, and, I, and I really think uh, that most of these problems that we're facing are human caused and can be solved by, by humans. Um, but they also uh, require that there are people demanding the solutions. At the, one of the um, voluntary commitments, one of the partnerships launched at the uh, summit or at the conference was on... Um, uh, the value chain of tuna fishing from the Pacific all the way to the dining table in, in the U.S., where, some, uh, where, where a, a system of traceability of uh, where, where you, in a way, put a marker on the fish at the source at the fishing, and then you as a consumer can trace all the way uh, with, your, with your phone, basically, where that fish exactly comes from, when it was fished, and so on. But consumers in the United States are not demanding that in the same way as a consumer in Germany or, or, or Sweden. So the enforceability is higher in Europe than it is in the United States. Great. That was a great segment. I, Kerry, um, I'm going to look to wrap this at 20.35, which is 30 minutes from now. We've got three more panelists, so that's somewhere between 9 and 12 minutes, which means we're ring-fencing about 15 minutes of conversation, and that's a long way of uh, putting the audience or participants on alert. We need some good questions and good conversation. All right. Hello, I'm back. Okay. Um, so without, and thank you for this, the panelists who've uh, been very patient so far. So I'm next going to, no, I'm not. We're going to take a quick, quick question and then we close that thread. Um, it's, it's mainly a comment, actually. Who are um, you? My name is Hannah Stanton. I represent the United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth. I'm their global, global focal point for SDG 14 and happen to live in Malmo. Um, so, um, <laughs> it's a conspiracy, okay. <laughs> and, uh, no, no, it's not, no, not, not conspiring at all. But I think for me, one of the main aspects coming from a children and youth and next generation and future leaders, etc. perspective, I, um, I need more um, knowledge transmission. We need better education. Because when we did our youth consultation with the young people, um, most of them were sort of like, oceans, what? Well, I want to talk about education, I want to talk about uh, gender equality, but talking about SDG 14, what, that is so vitally important, was just not as interesting to them. And I think there is something we need to, we need to burst that bubble of knowledge that is there and let it trickle out to other people, um, especially young people who are carrying these vital and important um, decision making forward but I think that's that's a key issue because I, I always find that we're talking with the same people who already know that's really fascinating it, it? It, it strikes me that I don't know <laughs> the people who live on or by the oceans take them for granted a little bit yeah. Is that an issue? And people who don't live on or by the oceans don't think about them that much? Well, that, and I think what, I, what we found as well is that those who are engaged are so engaged, they so, know so much, they are so deeply into it, that it is difficult to then transmit that knowledge and that accessibility to people who are just not that into sustainable development just yet. 
So we really have an issue of finding ways to bridge that very technical, intricate, wonderful knowledge that we have gathered to people who just want to do the right thing. I'm going or to, need a note I'm to, going to invite you and the mayor to join me in a youth town hall in Malmo in October where we do it in a good fish restaurant, <laughs> right? We're not going to do the full buffet. We'll just give them finger food. <laughs> and you mobilize the youth in Malmo, and we'll call that a local 2030 hub initiative, all right? Is that agreed, Lady Mayor? <laughs> I think we have to visit, visit um, in October, we, we open up a new marine education and visit center. Okay. So before that dinner, we have to visit this. And they already have some... some uh, we've, got, we've got a full program. They this work quite a lot with the schools today, but okay. I'll let you visit it as well. <laughs> <laughs> Special pass. All right, now, moving on. And Ellen, I noticed you were nodding, not vigorously, but nodding within reason when our colleague uh, from Malmo made the point there. So I'm delighted to ask Miss Ellen Pickich, who's the Executive Director, Stony Brook University Institute for Ocean and Conservation Science. Three to four minutes, the floor is yours. Thank you. Oops. Thanks very much. Um, it's my, my great pleasure and honor to be addressing you. Um, I am a scientist and an educator and so when you talked about um, we need more education, I, I completely agree. I, I want to focus my remarks today on one of the targets within SDG 14, and that's SDG 14 target five. And there are two main reasons why I want to focus on those two. One is because I've been working on that target for quite a bit over the past few years. And uh, secondly, I think it's a good example of something that seems to be showing promise that it's a target that we can likely achieve within the time frame. So I think it would be good also for us to, to think about things that are working, why are they working, and how can we do more of it so that we can get other parts of SDG 14 moving along as well. Um, so what is SDG 14.5? It's to protect 10% of the ocean by the year 2020. And just, just that in itself, the fact that SDG 14.5 has a measurable goal, 10%, and it's, um, it's a specific goal, 10% and measurable, and that the timeline is 2020, not 2030. I think all of those things make for a, li a higher likelihood of success. Because if you don't have a quantitative target, and if the, the time frame for the target is so far away that it seems like you can keep, you'll, I'll worry about that one tomorrow, then there's no sense of urgency. And what I've seen, I've been working on this issue um, at the UN through a consortium called the 10 by 20 Initiative. This is a coalition of member states and other types of organizations. Um, when we started our work in 2014, about 2% of the ocean was protected in any way at all. And less than 4% was promised to be protected. Before the ocean conference, we did a roundup of what progress had been made by early June. And in that short period of time, the amount of ocean protected was over 4%, so had more than doubled, and the amount pledged was 6.5%. And then during the Ocean Conference, there were several com uh, commitments, voluntary commitments made to increase the amount of marine protected area still more. Um, I don't know that the final statistics are in, but I know that they included at least four very large, greater than um, 400,000 square kilometer areas, and probably about, we're up to about eight or nine percent of the ocean being pledged to be protected by the year 2020. At the end of the conference, this was one of the things that many of the delegates were smiling about at the end of the conference as a real positive, tangible outcome, that um, this is a goal, this is a target that we're likely to achieve and let it be a model for the other targets in SDG 14. So again, as a scientist, I think that we tend to think about things in terms of principles 
and also case studies, things you could really sink your teeth into and say, how did they do it and why did it work? Um, so this is just a very general, general set of principles about specific, measurable timetable. And this can be done at the local level just as it's been done at the global level. And this is one of the things that I would recommend be done, that even for Target 5, that we have more goal setting and timetable setting between now and 2030 at the local level. Um, and the same thing for the other SDGs, some of which are really quite nebulous. If you look at them carefully, you don't see a lot of numbers in there, and that is a concern. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about was the importance of education in the process of this 10 by 20 initiative being successful. And we can't take all the credit for what's been happening, but we'll take a little bit. One of the things that we did was to educate um, ambassadors, ministers, heads of state about the science of marine protected areas. Um, how do they work? The fact that they can work. What makes them mo most effective? What are the principles that can be used to design them in a way that they will be most effective? And one of the other things that we've done is brought other speakers to this forum who can talk about how to implement them, how to govern them, how to finance them. There is financing available, and in many cases, the ones who do the financing and the, and the entities that need the finance don't know about one another and don't know how to get together. And this is an important role that, that we try to serve and I think in some cases have successfully served. Um, so I think I'm pretty close to my time. I'll just say that um, it's nice to have something where you feel like you're making a difference and that's a positive example. Um, I could talk about some more local examples later if there's time. Thank you very much. Ellen, thank you for that input. Really important. That was, that was a very half-hearted clap. I didn't like that clap. That's, that's a bit better. Thank you, folks. Listen, we're going to go straight on to our next speaker. And um, that is just a cool job title. Just listen to this. Mr. Dan Myers. International Policy Man Ma Manager, Pristine Seas National Geographic. I am envious. I've got job title envy, uh, Dan. Uh, you're on deck for three minutes. Well, thank you, Paul, and thank you, uh, Local 2030, for convening this excellent panel. Um, as Paul mentioned, my name is Dan Myers, and I'm the International Policy Manager for National Geographic Pristine Seas. Our program at National Geographic is focused on target 14.5 helping the global community achieve its goal of protecting 10% of the ocean by 2020. And I would like to echo my colleagues' uh, sentiments that we have made great progress towards that goal. When we started this, we were near 1% or 2%, and now we're somewhere in the ballpark of 3 or 4 With commitments, it's possible that we are as high as 8%, but I... Yes, commitments. As a policy guy, I'm generally skeptical of such things because it, there's a very big difference between announcements, excuse me, and commitments. And so we must look forward to how we can achieve this goal in such a short period of time. We need to essentially double what we've done in almost half the time. And how do we do that? We have to look to large scale reserves. Reserves like the ones that were just announced here at the UN Oceans Conference, like the Juan Fernandez people of Chile a small set of islands off the coast of Chile who decided that as a local community that they wanted to see large-scale protection because they knew it would benefit their fisheries. They knew it would benefit tourism for them. How do we enable more stories and populations like that to do similar things? How do we enable more populations like those of Tristan de Cunha, the UK overseas territory of 270 British citizens who control 700,000 square kilometers of ocean, who has said to the UK government, we see what you're doing in the rest of the Blue Belt states. We want to do the same. How do we create a regime of protection in our waters to ensure that they are protected now and forever? So as we look towards the 10% goal, how do we also scale our ambition past that? Because what science tells us now is that 10% is just the beginning. We must now look more towards 30, even 40% of the ocean protection if we are to return it to a somewhat healthy state. To end, I'd like to echo 
something my colleague Mr. Christensen said, that we need more coalitions, we need more knowledge sharing, because at this point we have so many of these disparate little communities who are signs of hope, to borrow from Bobby Kennedy, ripples of hope in the world. <laughs> But it's very hard for them to share knowledge between them, to share lessons learned. And putting these large-scale protected areas, small-scale protected areas together is a difficult process. And so it's this body that I think can really add to that, to create something like a C40 in the climate world, but for oceans. So thank you. Okay, Dan, thank you for being very uh, right on time. That was excellent. I've just got a question. You know the Antarctic Treaty and the whole protection of the Antarctic waters? Is that, that's been relatively successful since the late 50s, hasn't it? And, it, and is that a model? Is that something that could be, could be uh, souped up, ubered up? And I, I'm a, just an old Antarctic obsessive, all right? It's, it's seen to be a very successful model, and I will defer to some of my colleagues with more expertise in the field. But as you may have seen recently, Camelar, the governing body for the Antarctic, recently created the largest marine protected area in the world in the Ross Sea, more than a million square kilometers. Yeah. And so to that end, it has been tremendously successful, given that the Antarctic is so remote and there's no permanent population there, to replicate it in other places except for somewhere like the Arctic would be a tremendously difficult task. Got you. Okay. You know what? We're going to bounce. I normally don't do this. But we're going to bounce on to our final panelist who's been super patient. Uh, and thank you to all the panelists for being time disciplined because we still rank, r ring fence some conversational time at the end. So, Mark Newhouse, I don't have your title, but you are with the Oceans Alliance. Hi. And uh, the, the floor is yours. The deck is yours. Thank you. Thank you. The, am I on? Uh, so I'm president of the Ocean Sanctuary Alliance. We are a partnership of diplomats, scientists, and individuals from the private sector. Our singular focus is the achievement of Target 5 of SDG 14, which, as you've heard, calls for protecting at least 10 percent of the ocean by 2020. That's in three years. Uh, we see ocean sanctuaries, ocean protected areas, as the best and perhaps the only hope of reversing the decline of the ocean. Uh, no reputable scientist thinks that protecting 10 percent of the ocean will do it. Uh, most people say you need 30 percent before you can reach some sort of equilibrium uh, where you are regenerating marine life as fast as you are harvesting it. But you have to get to 10 percent before you get above it. <clears throat> Our activity is mostly at the UN where we work with member states who are interested in protecting their areas and helping others to protect their ecosystems. Um, I had three quick points, but I'm going to reduce it to two. <clears throat> Thank you. We, as an NGO, we are very conscious that the only organizations that can protect the ocean are GOs, governing organizations. Uh, they don't have to be states. They don't, they don't have to be nation states. They can be states, provinces. They can be cities. They can be <coughs> departments. Um, and I would say uh, that you shouldn't wait for the UN. You shouldn't wait for your capitals to take action. Uh, if you are a subnational group, figure out your own ocean protection, take your future into your own hands, consult with your scientists, and, and come up with a way to protect your own areas. And I can give you some examples. Uh, the state of California in the U.S. has protected huge areas of kelp forest. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the town of Southampton, which is a suburb of New York, uh, has created, uh, at the instigation of Dr. Pickett, a very large protected area in Shinnecock Bay where they are using uh, shellfish to uh, get rid of algae pollution. Uh, and we've also heard about uh, a marine reserve that was set up in Indonesia. The impetus from it came from a private resort. They organized it. They got the state to declare it. So, uh, <clears throat> and frankly, we found that national governments, which are subject to change every few years, and which can even manage to make goals like ocean preservation into political issues, may not be the best governments to entrust with the uh, achievement of SDGs. And uh, wouldn't it be great if subnational entities could work directly uh, with UN agencies uh, and NGOs and third parties? And uh, by the way, if subnational entities are looking uh, for a way to contribute uh, to achieving SDG 14 on their own, uh, what about banning single-use plastic bags? And I'm looking at you, Malibu. <laughs> uh, as you heard, uh, in short order at the present trajectory, there are going to be more plastic bags than fish. My second point, uh, funders are actively seeking ocean projects. 
uh, Sanctuary Alliance has brought a number of funders to our meetings, both as speakers and observers, in the private and public sector, and that would include the World Bank, the Global Environmental Facility, the Walton Family Foundation, UNDP, Ocean 5, the Avatar Alliance, Bloomberg Foundation, Pew Charitable Trusts, and the Bertarelli Foundation. So from our viewpoint, the money is there to create protected areas. Uh, you have to ask for it. You have to know how to ask for it. But these donors are already supporting ocean projects and are eager to, provi to provide funding for more. They come to us and say, help us find projects to fund. We see our job as to put funders and GOs together with projects and make them happen. That's what I have. Thank you. Mark, that was marvelous. And that, that's the sort of intervention. Go on, yes, please. That's the sort of intervention that can catalyze an awful lot of cocktail conversations. And I mean that respectfully, because there's, there's, there's challenges there, right? And you're being very direct, and that's, uh, that's interesting and helpful. I, I want to sort of come straight back at you to give the participants uh, uh, 60 seconds to, to, to get the, the mental juices flowing and, and feed some questions. We've got 15 minutes, which is great. Um, I think, it, what is it, 20, 21 out of the 31 megacities are on the coast, right? I mean, is there, a, is there a sort of, is there a league table of who's doing, who's acting, who's protecting? You know, I mean, I guess there's quite a spectrum of action in given those mega coastal megacities. Um, what, what's the state of play? And I'm sure there's not a simple answer, but what's the state of play? Well, it's up to local leadership. I mean, there, there is no state of play. Uh, some mayors, some governors have a lot of uh, power. Maybe in some countries they have very little. Uh, uh, I, I would say if you have it, the power, do it. Just don't wait because uh, 2020 is around the corner and this is an urgent matter. Susan, if you want to come in. And I'm looking for hands for questions. I think Diego, maybe you had a question. But Susan first. Thank you for that, Mark. And if anyone wants to come in from the panel, uh, Thomas briefly, then to Su Thomas and Andrew, then to Susan, then to Diego, then to our friend who asked the question yesterday about culture. Okay, forgive me, I'll find your name. Uh, Thomas. Well, I, I think the political dynamics at global level around the ocean will also change in years to come. The question was asked about the ocean and the climate agreement, and, and clearly it's a, it's a mistake that they weren't there, but uh, the, the climate panel, uh, IPCC, is working on a special report on the ocean that will uh, that will be uh, out uh, in 2018 or 2019. So I think uh, as we move along, the ocean agenda will be submerged into the climate agenda. And there was a reference to the C40, which is this club of, of the largest cities in the world that are focused on climate action. I, I would say that, that you should get those mayors to also pick up the ocean, at least those of the C40 that are on the coast, which is probably most of them, and to take on the ocean challenge as part of what they do. I mean. Andrew, I think you had your hand up. Yeah. No, I want uh, I can actually share some very quickly some data, maybe to put some of this in context. Because if you look at the 1,400 or so voluntary commitments that came out of the registry, they are perhaps a proxy for what people are out there doing, or at least what people are willing to say they're doing, right? Yeah. So quick look, 26% of the combined commitments on that database are from NGOs and CSOs combined. Solid, non-national actor contribution, right? Uh, 81 or about 6% of the voluntary commitments were from the private sector. Eh, a little more subdued response, right? Now, in fact, the, the, the database wasn't even designed to accommodate, you know, and you know, indicate that you are a subnational state actor, a city or a province. It doesn't, that doesn't exist. But if you search, you know, just do quick search terms, municipality, municipal, province, city, very low occurrence of those. So I think it's pretty clear that the participation rate to date of sub subnational state actors in this process uh, has been very limited. So I think it's, it's actually, this session is quite opportune to flag so that issue. It's a huge opportunity it's to crank huge it opportunity. up. We know they're doing a lot. I mean, yeah. from Malmo to New York, to, they're, they're doing a lot from climate change to fisheries to pollution reduction. There's, there's, an, there's billions, maybe trillions out there going on, but it's, they, don't, they don't know about it. I honestly think a lot of, most cities don't even know about this initiative. So I think we need to look very, strongly at, at, at opportunities to bring the voluntary commitments process, the database, the opportunity to the subnational state actors. Brilliant. Good. So we have got um, Susan. 
and then we jump across to Diego and then Carrie from uh, ITU. Uh, was there another hand that I'm missing? We good? No. Two back here. Oh my lord! It's a <laughs> and, and and yes, sorry. Okay, so very quickly the order is Susan, and then Diego, and then Culture Lady, if you don't mind me saying that, and then Carrie, and then Joel, and then we'll be nearly finished. So Susan, over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Susan Alsner. I'm the head of the United Nations Non-Governmental Liaison Service here in New York. Uh, to bring into focus the uh, sustainability solutions aspect of Local 2030, our office uh, co-founded Solutions Summit with UN Foundation and Global Innovation Exchange and the SDG Philanthropy Platform. And every year we scout for leading solution makers in the world who, if uh, surrounded with proper supports, could bring SDG solutions to scale for maximum global benefit. And I want to highlight one of them, which I think is um, you know, the kind of project we could be looking for to accelerate progress, which has cross-cutting benefits across multiple SDGs, and that's a project called At Motion which is doing a wave energy generated desalination of seawater at motion, A-T-M-O-C-E-A-N, at motion. At, at that, so they use wave energy alone, no other energy input, to drive a pump to, which creates enough pressure to desalinate the ocean water, drive that onshore for drip irrigation to restore coastal ecosystems, and every installation creates a marine protected area. And it's scaled so you can deploy you know, small ones and, and add them on to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And even the fisher folk in the regions where they're deployed like it um, because it's helping them uh, maintain the, the uh, surrounding areas. So uh, projects like this, uh, my main point is they're already out there. And we need to look for them and find them and get them the scaling support that they need to be able to get to the goals that we're all striving for. Thank you. Susan, thank you for that example. I'm going to go straight to Diego. If you could introduce yourself briefly. I'm working with uh, Carrie in, in the whole um, building up Local 2030 and just wanted to highlight um, the importance that you, especially Mark, marked um, about uh, you know protected areas that are led by cities uh, and connect that to, the, to what Paul said about 21 mega cities being on coastal areas. So, uh, and then linking that to the C40 of cities, um, these networks need to be created. They're still not, not created. And I'm glad to hear these ideas as an ocean passionate. Um, but other than that, I want to turn around a little bit for the question and say, how do you foresee the UN coming? in this process and supporting um, these initiatives that are coming from the local level? How, how can the UN support this? Who would like to take that, just to answer that straight off the bat? Okay. Uh, Andrew, quick one. Thomas, quick one. Thank, thank you for the question, Diego. Thanks. Um, I think one example of how the UN has been and continues to support local action on SDG 14, but other SDGs as well, is a program, it's uh, financed by the Global Environment Facility, it's called the GF Small Grants Program. It's been in operation about 20 years, but uh, they released um, actually this booklet at uh, the Ocean Conference, Making Waves, Community Solutions, Sustainable Oceans. So, you know, the SGP is a very established, lean and mean running financial mechanism to provide grants to um, NGOs and, and civil society organizations working on, among other things, ocean issues, as well as climate change, biodiversity, land, et cetera. Uh, Thomas. Two points. Um, Portugal and Kenya have offered to host a follow-up conference to the Ocean Conference in 2020, and that will have to be decided uh, probably in the fall in the next session of the General Assembly. Um, Sorry, Thomas, just I didn't... Portugal and... Kenya. Okay, gotcha. Uh, they've both made offers, so the hope is that they will join forces and, uh, and co-host like Sweden and uh, Fiji did, uh, maybe have the conference in, in one of the places and preparatory meetings in the other and, and sort of support each other over the next three years in doing this. And I would urge you who feel about the local uh, element to work to have the local, I mean, uh, become part of the organizing of that, of that conference, put it, put it into the um, agenda. Uh, and secondly, the, um, 
the UN system, as far as I know, uh, is currently has been asked by Secretary General Guterres to uh, come up with sort of the follow-up plan. What what's the UN going to do to act on what came out of the conference? Uh, and that that work is being left by the office of the Secretary General. So. Uh, those here who represent that office could maybe have a word with their colleagues and see how the local dimension could also become part of that follow-up. Thank you for this. This is how we're going to finish. We've got four questions, and we're going to get four quick answers. So we're going to rattle through in six minutes, okay? And as they say, time and tide waits for no man or woman or woman or man, whichever way you want it. So let's get going. Quick questions. Try and direct it to a panelist. And I'm going to ask, is the... the um, Lady Mayor, do you have to leave? Uh, okay, that's I think fine. We're running out of time. No, so. no worries. Thank you very much. Put your hands together for Malmo, and thank we'll you. see you in conference. <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see you in October. And thank you for your participation and the huge amount of activity, energy, and initiatives that Malmo are setting in train. It's exciting. Um, right, so quick questions and quick ans answers. Ali, if you could briefly, briefly introduce yourself and then the question. Sure. Oh, sorry. Uh, Ali Mazzara with State University of New York, our global center. Uh, it's for Dr. Pickett and uh, maybe Mr. Newhouse. I love the idea of the focus of very tangible goal with the target five of um, number 14, SDG 14. And I tie it in with the comment before about education between wanting to have people who are very in knowledgeable and then people who want to do the right thing but don't have that knowledge. So is there, and I know you were talking about locally with Southampton out in um, Long Island, is there a way of developing a model or have, I mean, I don't want to add to the work you already have, but since we're talking about local 2030, are there ways we can develop models that other SDGs can use that can be learned from what you have already experienced? Good, we'll take the second question, then we'll have the answers. So carry your opportunity. Okay. I just want to, because a lot of you were not here yesterday, but there is actually a UN city platform rolling up now. It's called United for Smart Sustainable Cities. It's set up by, ITU is in the lead together with UNECE, but we have 16 UN agencies in this platform. So it's not just about, it. ITU as a standardizing organization is behind this. But we, are, we have developed KPI for smart, sustainable cities. We're starting to evaluate 100 cities now on these KPIs. There is a lot on related topics here. It's a solution platform. We get, a, of course, uh, an evaluation of the cities, but it's also set up how do you bring in industry, how do you bring financing to a lot of these projects. I just, where you are, I, I think UNDP is, is clearly a part of this initiative already, but I think there could be a very natural bridge here into the cities and C40 and clearly focusing on big cities, but you know, the biggest troubles is a lot of the smaller, medium cities. And I think we need to target them. And that's also the target of this, a lot in, in, in uh, developing countries. So this platform is something, the KPIs is, is, has been developed to be uh, uh, applicable for any cities. So we have core and advanced indicators. I would just invite you to take a look at the U4ICC and, and see how we can maybe bridge this together and use this as an awareness raising platform. We did a flip book now for the first phase of U4ICC with uh, case studies for every SDGs in cities. And there's clearly also 14 in, but I would just- Carrie, I'm gonna take that a step forward. Thank you. One of Carrie's team, I think um, Carrie gave a very great but brief presentation yesterday, the two slides, the global map, the 100 cities. I think anyone who's participated over the last two days, we should circulate that through that participation group and the speakers. So Carrie, I'll, you're linked with Diego and that just should be done, okay? Uh, because we didn't really give full justice to United for Cities and we should have done and it's super exciting. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. Right, we're getting there. Who wants to answer the question? Uh, Ellen, you're going to give a quick reply to Ali's question, and then we can bring it in just about on time, I think, with Joel and Stella asking questions. Ellen. So thank you, Ali. This gives me a chance to talk a little bit about the project in Southampton that we have. And in Southampton, which is about 80 miles from, Manhatt from where we are right now in Manhattan, um, so it's doable to do a round trip in a day. And we have done this. We have the Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program. And the cornerstone of that program is to create protected areas that protect shellfish. The overfishing of oysters and hard clams in that bay in the past reduced the filtration capacity of the bay, the natural filtration capacity, and as a result, 
We've had harmful algal blooms, some of which can even be fatal to humans. Um, very concerning. And so that's the cornerstone. What we were, but, but what I wanted to say is that even though protected areas are the cornerstone, there are so many different things that we're doing that relate to each of the other SDGs. Overfishing, pollution, you know, so we can illustrate all these things. And last year, in 2016, we took a group of ambassadors from New York out there, took them out on the research vessel, showed them the difference in condition in the marine protected areas, outside those areas, and then brought them back in the same day. And it was, I think, you know, a very, very well-received program that could be duplicated. Ellen, there's a deeper conversation. There's piping hot coffee waiting for us all outside. Okay. So we're just a few minutes off that. You can continue over coffee. Ali, thank you for that. And I still don't think you had your culture question answered. Anyway, turning quickly to Joel. Joel, you had a quick question directed to a panel member. Yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, uh, so... Uh, 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 Come closer to your mic, if yeah, you would. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. This is about the, the fact that uh, the rule of sustainable development, you have three pillars. You have economy... You have ecology and you have society. So my point is, why not use people as their own platform so they can be involved in the activities? And we know that people can be involved in the cleaning if they are involved in the activities themselves. I have two examples, Seychelles. Take Seychelles, who are doing the cleaning? These are the, the people who work in the hotel, in the tourism industry, it's not the kids. The kids go to school, they, have the, they are educated. But not that. Is, that's, and myself, I, I work in in, uh, in Polynesia. Polynesia, the Ministry of uh, Education gave me an assignment. You have to protect the tortoise, the lut tortoise, because people eat, was eating the, the tortoise. So they couldn't they couldn't trust the people to to clean the to protect the, the, the sea life, you know. So they told the teacher because. Thank you. Joe, very much. the points are very well taken, thank and you. that last example was a, a really really granular super one, thank so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Stella, briefly, uh, the lady in the blue top, and then we're closed. So Stella, question or comment, let's move to finish. Okay, yeah, so I just wanted to uh, make a point about uh, pollution, because actually, uh, pollution has been regulated for a long time, and for example, from the shipping uh, industry under the International Maritime Organization. The past 40 years, conventions have been in place to regulate all forms of pollution from ships. And these are very effective. So I think the, the main issue here uh, is land-based pollution, which obviously remains to the states to govern. So we have to bear in mind that, uh, you know, efforts are there, but the, the effort needs to come from states. And one thing that I, I had a question um, mainly to Ms. Gachivalli, it was the fact that now we're talking about a new implementing agreement to UNCLOS for biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. How do you think this will impact and help the achievement of SDG 14? Right, let's take that question. Thank you. Brief response, if it's possible, or you could take it over coffee. I think I'll take it over coffee. Good. Uh, All right. Good it's question. It's a rather tricky one. Coffee uh, answer. <laughs> and the final question, final interaction before we put our hands together frenet frenetically and then dash for coffee. You, who are you? And, um, I am um, a marine consultant based in UK. Uh, I want to share two things based on my experience. Where in the UK? Is it a port? London. Well, okay, London. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I want to share two things uh, from my own experience. One is about uh, conservation zones. As one of the people who helped develop the protect areas in England, okay. um, I want to emphasize the issue of enforcement. We tell people go and develop, uh, establish MPAs. It is very important to have enforcement. Without it, things don't work. And the other thing I want to say is I'm looking at developing countries right now, how they do with SDG 14. And we heard a lot about initiatives. A lot of them are online. We expect people to go online and see them. A lot of those people don't have access to Internet. How do we reach? My question is how do we reach those people to actually achieve the bottom up initiatives? Listen, I'm not going to let you answer, but we're finishing strong. Thank you for that contribution and for your work in uh, England and the UK. It's been a good conversation, I feel. 
put your hands together, both of the panelists and yourselves. Coffee's outside. Uh, thank you very much to the panelists, and uh, do come back, because I think the poverty alleviation and equity uh, session starting at three or thereabouts will be a strong way to finish local 2030 hub for sustainability solutions. Coffee is served.